Welcome to Defiance Christian Church as you're coming in and finding your seats. I have a couple quick announcements from the bulletin. So I got uh, a, f- a couple friends I'm inviting up today. Uh, so Brad, Harsha, wherever you're at, Brad, come on up here. And, and Becky Fleshman, if you could be on cue for next. We've got a, a host of volunteers that come on up here. And uh, my wife and I were talking this week and she said, well, how was the board meeting? And I said, it was good. And she goes, really? And I said, yeah, it was, it was a good board meeting because we got to talk about future event planning stuff. Because we're coming out of our, our, our borough, out of this hibernation state that we've been in, and, and we're going to start planning some different church activities and, and getting back to normal life. And so one of the things that we're going to be starting is Wednesday nights, and those will be starting on the 30th of September, and we still need some help with early, early elementary education. So like that K through fifth grade in there, if that's an ed, uh, age group that you would like to help out with, we need some help because we have... And a toddler teacher for Sundays or for Wednesday night? Sundays. So there's a couple different teaching roles. So if you are thinking, you know what, I'd like to help out with the young kids, um, see my wife and, and she'll be able to direct you in that, uh, those directions. But Brad's got something for us. So what you got going on, Brad? Okay. Well, we, like Mike said, we had our meeting uh, Thursday night. And uh, if your family has been like our family, uh, we always look forward to this time of year because we have lots of different events that uh, we do here at the church and we fellowship together. And due to COVID, that's probably not going to be possible this year. And so we started talking about what can we do? What are some things that we can do? And so um, one of the things we came up with was something we're going to call DCC Gives Back. And it's going to start next uh, Sunday. And so those of you who have been here and uh, been through a Jersey Sunday before, uh, you wear your favorite, uh, favorite, any team, it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's high school, excuse me, professional, college, whoever you want to support, um, wear the shirt, wear the jersey here next Sunday. Um, due to COVID, we, we will not be having the, the lunch afterwards. But what we're going to do is we're, we're going to start that theme of giving back. What can we do in the community? Um, during this time of, of shutdown, um, I know there were a lot of us that felt hopeless in terms of, you know, I want to do something, but I don't know what. So we're going to start by next um, Sunday. We are going to um, have a food uh, donation drive, and you're going to see a table out there already. Um, And I know it's a short turnaround time in terms of (laughs) closing it next Sunday, but um, this is, you know, as you hear the schedule, this is kind of how we worked it out. Um, But we're going to support the PATH Center. So on on top of, you know, wearing our jerseys and having fun with that atmosphere, uh, we're also going to be giving back to our community. And I believe it was Mike talked to the PATH Center on uh, Friday. And due to COVID, they're short on some foods that they normally would already have donated due to other events. And so there's a few different ways you can give. Um, And in the bulletin, uh, you'll see under Jersey Sunday, it'll talk about some of the items they need. Um, But specifically, the canned vegetables, canned soups, or like with the the chunky soups. And Mike, you said pull tops are really important, correct? So the the pull tops that can open up, and there's a few out there now that you can see if you want some ideas. Peanut butter, jellies, non-perishable foods. Um, but, and there's also, if you're like, I don't know if I'm going to get to the store to get it, we do have a donation box out there too if you just want us here at the church to pick up some of those um, items as well. Um, but we want this theme of DCC Gives Back to really set us through through the rest of this year. And so in October, you're going to hear more about a, the way our worship team is going to give back to our, our family here, but also to members of the community, people that just want a night to, to listen to, to music. You'll hear more about having a chance to come on a Sunday night to our parking lot, spread out, and hear some live music. Uh, and, and just to give you another sneak peek, in November, uh, when we typically have our Thanksgiving dinner, uh, we are, are not going to be doing that this year. Uh, we'll still do our, is it Night of Remembrance? Mm-hmm. Um, and we will be supporting another local organization at that time. And so you'll find out what type of items they need during that time. And then during the Christmas time, we'll continue with our white um, by envelope Christmas offering. So even though that it's been a time where we can't fellowship the way we used to and uh, maybe not have the events that we used to, um, we have an opportunity to, to, to set the standard the rest of the year to, to start you know, doing our DCC gives back and really set us up for a great 2021. So it's a great way to do things together, but also to give back to our community. And uh, th- there may just be a little treat on your way out next Sunday as well. So um, please come. Please wear your, your, like I said, your favorite high school, college, professional, any, any team that you support. And uh, also, if you get a chance to bring any of those goods for the past Center, I know they'll be uh, much appreciated. So thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Brad. And my good friend, Becky Fleshman, come on up here. And uh, I'm excited about this. One of the other 
uh, opportunities for us to minister together is going to be a new women's study. Okay, October 5th, I believe, is that what I said? Yep. Monday, October 5th, just a new study, uh, a group for us ladies to get together any age um, just to do life together. Study the word, pray, and grow together and just learn how God made us unique so we can influence our little circles in our lives. So, October 5th, 7, 7 p.m. 7 to 8, 7 to 9, 7 to 10, 7 to 11. Probably seven to eight. <laughs> okay. We'll see. It's a bunch of ladies. It's a bunch of ladies. We'll see how it goes. All right. All right. Good deal. Yeah. Thank you so much. Hey, let's pray. I'm excited. We've got lots of different opportunities. There are things that we can't do, but there are also things that we can do. So let's focus on what we can do, and let's, let's be the church. God, thank you that we can be here, and that we can worship you, and that we can do Jersey Sunday. It's a little modified, but it's going to work. We can do a Monday night ladies Bible study. We can do Wednesday night church. We can, we can do these things. And we're going to do them safely. And we're going to do them because we want to honor you and praise your name. God, I pray that you will uh, just be with our hearts today as we worship. And I pray that you will encourage our spirits. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, welcome to DCC. And if you're able, let me invite you to stand with us. I'm going to start this morning off with a reading from Psalms 57. Uh, Awake, my soul. Awake, O stringed instrument and harp. I will wake up at dawn. I will give you thanks before the nations, O Master. I will sing praises to you before foreigners, for your loyal love extends beyond the sky and your faithfulness reaches the clouds. Rise up above the sky, O God, and may your splendor cover the whole earth.
God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. come together for communion. Our communion meditation is from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 18 through 21. We live in a world where it often seems as though We are strangers in a strange land. It has been so, so long ago, the garden, that we left and we live in this world of pain, suffering, war, starvation, hate. But we celebrate this communion because God has changed all that. For through him we have both our access in one spirit to the Father, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. We are no longer strangers. We are members of a household. And we need to remember that as we celebrate this cup, as this cup of thanksgiving, what we are thankful for is, as the old song songwriter said, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this loaf and for this cup, for the suffering and for the death, for the price that you paid, that we can be no longer strangers to God, that we are one in you and we are members of a household. It is in that name that we pray. Amen. If you've noticed the offering box out in the foyer, we're trying to be a little more social distancing with the offering. If you've checked the church's website, defineschristian.org, you'll notice that there is a link to Realm. It's our online giving uh, software. Um, 
we are still collecting the offering. We are still giving to God's kingdom. Let's pray for that. Father, we thank you that you have blessed us enough that we can give back just a portion of what we've received. Bless this offering. Bless these gifts. Help them to further your kingdom on this world. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. It seems that uh, there's important days assigned to important events frequently. You know, I, 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 these two I don't know. I haven't checked them out yet. But uh, the, the celebration of National Jeans Day. I don't know if that's true. You can fact check me and figure it out. Or, or National Donut Day. I mean, if it's not, these should be days and they should be celebrated. And we should have a day off for jeans and donuts. And, but my, my daughter was explaining, yeah, I got some donut fans out here. And uh, you can fact check me let me know if those are official holidays. Uh, but she let me know that there are days for these two uh, things. She let me know that there is a giraffe day, it's June 21st, and there is an elephant day, that's August 12th. And I looked them up, and they're actually World Giraffe Day and World Elephant Day. And I thought, well, there you go. There's an official day for giraffes and an official day for elephants. And if you were paying attention this past week, we had one of those days uh, what was the federal holiday? It wasn't a holiday, but it was a, one of those days, one of those significant days where we remember something. This past week on Thursday, Constitution Day. Well done, Mindy. Constitution Day was this past Thursday. Uh, it's the 233rd celebration of the signing of the Constitution of the United States of America. On September 17, 1787, the Founding Fathers signed the most influential document in American history, the U.S. Constitution. And, and as, I think about, as I think about our country and this nation that we live in, um, this American experiment, let's see if we can try something new, guys, gals, let's, let's get together and let's make this nation and, and let's, let's try to do this. One of the things I respect a lot and I appreciate about our country is the vision and the goals that they set forth in our documents. The visions and the goals that they set forth in our documents, these lofty uh, purpose that, that they wanted to get to, that they sought to achieve. And yes, America has, we have mistakes, we have blunders, but for the most part, I think we've done a pretty good job. I think we've done a pretty good job of, of providing peace and prosperity and freedom for the people who live here. And, and being an example uh, for those to look at us and say, wow, that, that looks like a good place to live. I wonder if we can make this look like that. And we're coming up on an election, and, and I've been encouraging you, myself here, uh, to, to take part in, in, in voting and to vote as a Christian. I, 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 I struggle with the separation of, of politics is here and my faith is here. In, in, my, in my life, I hope that my faith has invaded every area of my life. That there's not secret compartments where I keep, you know, my, my hobbies separated from Christ, my family separated from Christ, my political views separated from Christ. I don't, I don't understand that. I would hope that as a Christian, the, the, the belief that Jesus is my Savior and submitting to his word and, and following the biblical worldview should invade all areas of my life. And so we've been looking at some different, some different biblical topics and how they relate to our political system in America today. And I pray that we can do so today as well. Uh, so let's pray and let's jump into the scripture this morning. God, we thank you for this country. We thank you for the goals of the, the men and women who set forth to create this country. And I pray that we can continue to be a place that pursues life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. God, I pray today for the, uh, the family of Ruth uh, Ginsburg and for her family as they grieve her passing. God, I pray for our court system here in America that you help good, wise, godly judges to step in and to fill their, fulfill their roles people who will lead this country in the right direction to promote 
the best life possible for our citizens so that, so that we can take that freedom and tell the good news of Jesus Christ. So that we can be your people and share that news with everyone around us. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. I mentioned one of the things that I'm proud of for being an American is our documents, our goals that our founding fathers set forth. But let me just take you a quick, quick recap into, into history. In 1776, this is from the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson, including input from John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Robert Livingston, and Robert, uh, Roger Sherman. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Right from the beginning, that statement is huge. All men are created equal, and they are endowed with, uh, by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their power from the consent of the governed. We the people. It's, it's, it's us. A government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And its purpose is to allow us to continue to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the, the pursuit of freedom. That was 1776, the Declaration of Independence. Fast forward a couple years. Uh, 1787, our young nation was struggling. And George Washington called together 55 delegates from the 12 states to take part in the Constitutional Convention. There in Philadelphia, they worked to compose the Constitution of the United States of America. A preparatory statement was placed at the start of the Constitution as the convention drew to a close. It was called the preamble. Let me read from the preamble. We the people of the United States, originally it just said we the people of the states, but Governor Morris changed it to say the United States because that's what we strive to be as the United States. We the people of the United States, in order to form a perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, and provide for a common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our prosperity. Do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. The constitution was, was drafted and was set in place to help promote justice, fairness, and equality, to bring about domestic tranquility, peace, to provide for a common defense, to promote the general welfare, and the blessings of liberty, freedom. Freedom shows up again. The Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Liberty, this idea that we're free people. The preamble of the Constitution. The blessing of liberty, the blessing of freedom. We're free people. The Bill of Rights, December 15th, 1791. The first of ten, amendment, the first of ten amendments that read it to the Constitution. Proposed by James Madison in 1789. The First Amendment reads this. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the exercise, prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievance. All three of those documents, Declaration of Independence, the Preamble, and the Bill of Rights. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, the blessings of liberty, and the freedom of religion, the free exercise of religion. Of all the things that I appreciate about our country, one of the ones that I appreciate the most is the freedom of religion. A couple weeks ago, we talked about the opportunity to have a job. That is a good thing. We are shopping last night and uh, went into the Kohl's and there was a guy cleaning the bathroom and, and, and we're talking and he's like, I got a job. And I thought, you're absolutely right. You got a job and, 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 and just talking and he's like, I only got a couple more months and I'm going to pay off my house. And I thought, how cool. And, and he's just cleaning the bathroom in Kohl's, but he's got a job. He's got a job. He can take his work boots off at the end of the day and say, I provided for myself. I, I, I worked hard. And so, in our country, in the Bible, God calls us to work from the beginning. God took Adam and put him in the garden so he could work. So, how do we view work as we go to vote? 
How do, we, how do we pursue domestic work or international work? What's the best way possible? What are the policies that will ensure that we have an opportunity to work and to provide for our families? Last week, we talked about the, the lie of abortion that takes so many lives, so many innocent lives, and the pain that is brushed aside that I don't think ever goes away. We talked about that last week. Uh, today, I want to talk about, I want to talk about the, the freedom of religion. These are important issues that as Christians, as we go to vote, as we take part in being the government of this United States of America, how do, we, how do we view these issues through Scripture? And one of the most important things for me, this is my personal, this is my heart here. And you can, you can take whatever convictions you come to, this is between you and the Lord. But freedom of religion is one of the most important. The, the opportunity for the government to to back up and let me have the freedom to believe what I believe is true. And I'll, I'll tell you why I believe it's true here in a second. But to give me that opportunity and to protect that opportunity, that's one of the highest goals in my heart when it comes to voting. But that uh, the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment, the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, we have the opportunity, the freedom, the religious freedom to establish a religion. But this is the thing about Christians. We didn't establish a religion. We didn't come together and say, hey, I got a plan. I got a plan on how we could uh, convince all these people that uh, you should pay me and I'll only work on Sundays and that's it. That's, it's not this scheme, okay? This thing, what we're doing here, was established by someone much more important and influential than me. And that was Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 16. If you get your Bibles, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 16. This is, this is one of the things that I appreciate the most. Jesus built his church on himself, our cornerstone. Jesus built his church on himself, our cornerstone. If you're taking notes, this is one of the things that, that I appreciate the most about the church. It wasn't conceived by some guys sitting around going, hey, I'm bored, what do you want to do? Well, let's start a religion. That's not how they did this. This is from the beginning, from the beginning where God created the heavens and the earth where he sent his prophets and, and the, uh, the godly kings and the judges, and, and he, he brought the people of Israel out of slavery, and, and they're always pointing forward to the Messiah. Matthew chapter 16, Jesus has been on the earth for a while, and he's called his disciples to follow him, and, uh, and he pushes them. He wants to know if they recognize who he really is. Matthew chapter 16, we'll pick up the reading verse 13. When people came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And this, this is the answer that I think a lot of people will give today. I, I, think, I think I could say for the most part, people believe that Jesus was a historical figure that walked on this earth. But when you ask the question, who do people say I am? Well, you know, he was uh, like a hippie preacher, wore sandals, long hair, white robe, never got dirty. Crazy how that worked. Uh, you know, they had these, these misconceptions of who Jesus was. C.S. Lewis, he was either a liar, a lord, or a lunatic. He's either a liar because he's duping everyone and, 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 and lying to them. He was a lunatic because he thought he was really the son of God, or he is the Lord and Savior of my life. Jesus asked his disciples, what about everybody else? And they give these answers. And then he looks at his disciples and says, but what about you? The rubber meets the road. What about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the one we've been waiting for, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I will tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Jesus says, listen, you got that right. You got that right. You are Peter. And if you look at the Greek here, Peter is Petros, a Greek word for a small stone. And on this rock, that's the word Petra, that's a massive and movable boulder. I'll build my church. Jesus says, yes, Peter, you're right, and you're a little rock, and you'll take part in this, but I'm going to build the church on, on me, Jesus speaking on the solid, rock-solid truth of who I am. And Peter agrees with this. We're, we're going to take this, we're going to go to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, because this wasn't made up by just mere mortal men. This 
Christianity, what we have here, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, first, uh, this, what we have here, Christianity, the whole belief in Jesus Christ as our Savior was authenticated by who he was and what he did. 1 Peter chapter 2. Peter even affirms that Jesus is the cornerstone, the one on whom this church is built on. The, the early church fathers didn't just make this up out of nothing. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe this stone is precious, but those two who do not believe, the stone the builders have rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Peter says it's Jesus. Jesus is the cornerstone. Peter doesn't say it's me. It's Jesus, the cornerstone, upon which the church is built. And so we have a faith that's built in Jesus Christ. He established Christianity. And the reason I believe that that Christianity is true is the historical documentation of it, the historical proof. I like, um, I think news is interesting. I think news is interesting. But when it comes to the news, I want to have a, a witness that was, that was closely related to the, uh, to the subject. I want an eyewitness, someone who was there. I want an eyewitness, and I want some corroborating uh, other eyewitnesses that don't tell the story exactly as the, as the first eyewitness tells the story. Because if they all tell the same exact story, that sounds like my brothers and I, when we came home late, tell mom and dad that there was a train track and then two deer, Okay. Which train track? I don't know. Just tell them those. You know, you, you did this before. You've rehearsed the story and you say it over and over again. The disciples were eyewitnesses that saw what happened and they recorded it. And we have a wealth of manuscripts. Look it up. I encourage you to look it up. We have an overwhelming wealth of manuscripts that are dated really early to when the event happened. So historically, the event happens here. One of the earliest manuscripts is 130 uh, after Christ. Uh, 80 BC, BC 80, 80, 130 AD. So it's about 90 years after Christ. That could potentially be one, two, three generations away. That's long enough to say, hey, my dad was there. That's not how it happened. Hey, my grandpa was there. He told me that story. That's not how it happened. So we have a wealth of manuscripts from eyewitnesses that are, that are closely related to the event and the date. And these eyewitnesses paid for this story with their life. When my brothers and I would fabricate a story and our parents would put the pressure on, the squeeze on, one of us was always rat out. There was always one that would break first. You know it. The same is true in your family. That one sibling. Why do we include you in in these plans? And and the first one that breaks and folds and then everybody else starts crying and then you're all guilty and you all get in trouble. That's not how it happened. That's not what happened with the disciples. They all went to their death holding to the same story. You don't die for a lie. You don't do that. So we have this historical documentation that that Jesus built his church on himself, our chief cornerstone. And it's true and it's reliable. It's reliable because Jesus didn't come along and say, I'm the the Messiah and I want you to believe in me and um, that's just how it's going to be. Somebody who called him out and said, you prove it. You show me that you're Messiah. You, you do something to, to prove it. And so his entire life is filled with, John calls them, signs. Times where Jesus said, which is harder, to forgive someone of their sins or say, take up your mat and walk. To prove to you that I am who I am, take up your mat and walk. And your sins are forgiven. And he would do miracles to prove that he was the Messiah. Show me the most important miracle, the most influential miracle ever, and I'd believe that you're the Son of God. When Jesus said, okay, how about I die for three days and then come back? You know, the magicians, they do some pretty fancy stuff, but I've, and I'm not challenging one of them to try this, but I've never seen one of them die for three days and come back. And I hope they don't try. That would be 
That's not good. But that's what Jesus did. So my hope and my faith is built on someone who, who was dead, totally dead. <laughs> Investigate this stuff. Read about this stuff. Study about this stuff. And then came back to life. We didn't make this up. Jesus created Christianity. He built his church on himself. And, uh, and he's our chief cornerstone. So this isn't something that men just uh, established, just made up uh, so that we could promote our ideas. And, and I think about the, 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 uh, the Bill of Rights, um, you know, the, the exercise of, of free religion so that we can, be, we can be free. All three of those documents, Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Preamble, and the Bill of Rights, all of them include this idea that we're born to be free. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Genesis chapter 2, from the beginning, Genesis chapter 2, all the way at the beginning of your Bible, we were created to be free. From the very start, we were created to be free. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. This is the very beginning when God is making the world. He makes the garden. He makes it perfect. He makes all the animals. He makes Adam. Uh, he, he makes him fall asleep, wakes him up. There's Eve. Puts him in the garden. Verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. God says, I'm going to put you in this garden, and I'm going to give you freedom, free will. And that free will you will use to wreck everything. You'll choose your free will to choose sin and separate yourselves from God. But we have freedom. We are created to be free. And so when I think about, when I think about the government, one of the, one of the things that, that I want from my government is the opportunity to be free. To, if I want to live in Ohio, I can live in Ohio. If I want to go to Illinois, I can go to Illinois and see my parents. And then I can leave and leave my parents in Illinois. I, I, I want the freedom to be able to do that. I want the freedom to be able to homeschool my kids. If I want to homeschool my kids. I want the freedom to be able to choose what college I get to go to. I want to have the freedom to choose what job I can work at. I want the freedom to be able to show up on Sunday without fear of persecution in a large building that has a big cross on top of it said, this is a church. I want that freedom. That's very selfish of me. Or is it just, is that something that's just built inside of me? That God created me with a desire to, to be free. We were created to be free but not everyone gets to enjoy the freedom that we have here in America. There's religious persecution going on all around us today here in the world. Uh, when we talk about religious freedom here in America, when we talk about religious freedom, that means religious freedom for all. Religious freedom means freedom for all. Because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of, of, of freedom. And I'm a big fan of being able to meet together as a, as a church here on Sunday mornings. Uh, but in some countries, that's not allowed. In some states, that's still not allowed. There are still pastors who are fighting lawsuits and, and being arrested. I saw one pastor who said, uh, well, uh, you know, this is the uh, first time in my life, maybe I'm going to get involved in prison ministry. Really, prison ministry. And uh, I, I, wow. Um, I've not seen, okay, so the context, it's, it's for the health reasons, and, or is it government overstep? Okay, we could have that conversation. Let's not get too distracted on that. But in some countries, coronavirus or not, you can't have a big church building. You can't have a little church building. You have to go underground and hide. And it's not just the Christians. Tony Perkins served as a, the commissioner on the U.S. Commission of International Religious Freedoms. And he's exposed a wide range of religious freedom concerns around the world. In China, their government has detained over one million Muslim Uyghurs and subjects them to Communist Party indoctrination, forced labor, and torture. Because of your faith, we're going to capture you, put you in, a, in an indoctrination camp, and try to reprogram your mind to not believe what you believe because we don't like what you believe and we're the government and we're going to change that. That's concerning. Well, they're not Christians, so we don't have to worry about that. Who's next? First, it starts with the Uyghurs, and who's next? 
And I'm pretty sure China can't have big church buildings like this. I don't think that's allowed. Maybe in some areas, but I, in, in um, increasingly violent anti-Semitic attacks against Jews are on the rise in France. In Russia, Jehovah's Witnesses regularly face criminal charges for practicing their faith. Uh, Iran's Baha community is attacked for their religious identity. Yazidis in uh, northern Iraq have been hunted mercilessly by ISIS simply for what they believe. Faiths of all walks are persecuted around the world. And so we have this, we have this unique experiment here in America where we have this radical crazy idea where the founding fathers said, you know what? Let's have a nation where you have the freedom of religion, where you can believe whatever you want to believe. You have the freedom of religion. Now, you can't use that made-up religion to be a, a mask for bad behavior. Um, but if, if, it's, if it's a religion and, and, and you're following it and it's working, and so here in America... You know, I, I, I would like to fight for the freedom of religion for, for, for Christians. But I would also side and fight for the freedom of religion for, for Muslims, too. Because it's a, it's a two-way street. I would think that freedom of religion is a universal thing that should be ex- allowed in America. Some will say, no, Mike, you're wrong on that. We should have a Christian government, and the Christian government should ban all other faiths except for the Christian faith by force of penalty. And then we'll have a bunch of people who are Christians because we told them so. We forced their arm into it. And how long would that Christian faith faith stay pure? I don't think it'd stay pure for very long. These are my convictions. What are your convictions? What does the Bible say? We were born free. We have this nation where there's this crazy experiment where we're going to allow freedom of religion. How much longer will that last? How much longer would that last? I was talking to a good friend this week, and I was reflecting on uh, life pre-COVID. I know, right? Go back to there when we could meet for church on Easter and celebrate, you know, a somewhat significant the clutch to the Christian faith. Okay, I understand health concerns. I get it, um, but I was reflecting on life before COVID, and I was thinking of the freedom that we had the freedom to meet, the freedom to plan events here at the church, pack a bunch of people in, no masks, no distancing. Let's just have a a good old time. Back when we could could do that. And And I thought to myself, I said, what did we do during those times of freedom? Did we take them for granted? Ah, we'll always have religious freedom. We'll always have these opportunities to meet on Sunday morning, meet on Wednesday nights. Always have these opportunities to pack as many people as we can into this building and not be in fear of being arrested or shut down. So, so I wonder what we're doing with our, our religious freedom. I wonder if there will be a day when, and I hope this is not true, but what if, what if okay, so take corona out of it. Let's just take corona out of it. What if the government overstepped and Trample down religious freedom. Uh, you know, we worked with that for a while, but that's really not working well, so we're going we're gonna to overstep religious freedom, and we're going to kind of brush that one aside and, and take that out of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and the amendments. We're going to take that one out. Uh, oh, that'll never happen. The government would never do that. Many times I've heard that. That'll never happen. I, you know, I don't want to be prophetic or a doomsayer, but, 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 but think with me. If sometime in the future... There was a time where we didn't have a religious freedom. And you're telling your grandkids, you got them together and you tell them a story. Man, I remember back in the day when we could meet together on Sunday mornings in a church. We had a big, a big cross on top. Of, really? You could tell people publicly that you're a Christian and you weren't afraid of being arrested? Oh, those were the good old days. Oh, Grandpa, tell me, what did you do with your freedom? Nothing. I was so busy watching TV. You think about it. We have a ton of freedom now, even with the coronavirus restrictions and guidelines or whatever. What are we doing with it? What are we doing with the 
religious freedom that we have. This is why this is such a big deal to me. Religious freedom is huge for me when it comes to voting. I want my government to give us a, 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 a nation that is free to practice what we believe, what Jesus has instituted. Because I want to go crazy with telling people about Jesus Christ. I want nothing in my way. I want to make the most of all these opportunities that I have. And right now, we got a lot of freedom. And we're just twiddling our thumbs. I hope not. I hope not. I hope we're going crazy with it, and I hope we're making the most out of it. But it seems like there's a push. There's a push against us to, to start actively working against religious freedoms. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Last thing here. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And this is why it's important to me um, to continue to advocate for this. Religious freedom is, is important to me because it is the opportunity to free people from the chains of their sins. Religious freedom is important to me because it's the opportunity to free people from the chains of their sins. In, in your Bible, towards the back, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6. This is important. This is why I'm a big fan of, of religious freedom because it, it, it's an opportunity for me to go and to tell the good news of Jesus Christ to everyone and to do so without being afraid of of punishment. Chapter 6, verse 9. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Okay, so simply put, those who are in a sinful, sinful lifestyle and have not repented from their sins, have not accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, have not acknowledged that what they're doing is wrong, then they're outside of the, the relationship with their Heavenly Father and they'll spend eternity separated from him. That's the sad reality. Anyone in sin who dies that way is separated from God, and they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, neither to the sexual immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunken, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were but you were washed and you were sanctified and you were justified in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the Spirit of our God. This is an encouraging passage of Scripture to me. So first off, it starts pretty, pretty bleak. If you're outside of the love of Christ, then it's not going to go well. And then Paul lists a, a bunch of different sins that people struggle with. And many of these have been approved by our nation. What used to be um, accepted is now being condemned, and what was condemned is now switched and is accepted. It's interesting. I was, I was studying for this, and I was researching this, and I thought, that, that is, I, I didn't think I'd ever say this. What is one thing that Catholics, many Protestant Christians, Mormons, Muslims, and Orthodox Jews all have in common? Catholics, Many Protestant Christians, Mormons, Muslims, and Orthodox Jews all have in common. They hold to a traditional view of marriage. In their faith community, they believe that there is a divine being, God the Father of the Trinity, Elohim, Allah, Yahweh, whatever name they call him, that they would believe in traditional marriage. And as per their religious text and their religious teaching, that traditional marriage is what God has ordained and what he has called is appropriate and good. But we live in a society today where the uh, LGBTQ movement is forcefully pursuing acceptance, um, celebration of its agenda. And, and as, as a church, I, I, I look at what God's word says because I feel the pressure but I also see what God's Word says, and so I have to listen to God's Word and not to what the community tells me around me. And in God's Word, there is a list of sins. Any sin that's not forgiven, if we're not in a relationship with Jesus Christ, that will separate us from our Heavenly Father. Take your pick. If you give your life to being greedy, just making money, that's a big one. That will separate you from the love of Christ. And from our Heavenly Father. But it seems like in our, in our society that we've taken uh, what the Bible called a sin and we've changed it. We change it from the sin category, something that we needed to repent from. It's been moved from that category into something that is now 
uh, not only acceptable, but is now celebrated. And you don't have to repent from it. You can, you, can, you can live in this lifestyle, and actually God is now pleased with that. And I think that's not what the Word says in my Bible. And there's a force. I remember I, it stuck out to me. And I thought, would someone have said that 10 years ago? Because 10, year ten years ago, I wasn't paying attention. But I remember in the presidential debates in 2019, this is a quote. I'll leave the names out. Do you think religious institutions like colleges, churches, charities, should they lose their tax-exempt status if they oppose same-sex marriage? So if they hold to what the biblical worldview of Catholics, many Protestants, Mormons, Muslims, and Orthodox Jews, that's a lot of people. If they hold to that view, should they lose their tax-exempt status? And the, the presidential candidate said yes. There could be no reward, no benefit, no tax break for anyone or any institution and organization in America that denies the full rights and full civil rights of every single one of us. And I thought, that's interesting. That's scary. That's scary that someone that could have been running for the presidency of the United States of America this year, as per this answer of this moment in time, would have actively pursued to either make us change what we believe in the Bible or lose our tax-exempt status. Would, would they have said that 10 years ago, 20 years ago? Or is the attack on religious freedom getting closer and closer and closer? Why do I make a big deal out of this? Because people who are living in sin are separated from their Heavenly Father. That's, the, that's the, you, we could talk about it. We could talk about the, 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 I, this is crazy, right? I think the best combination is a mom and a dad who love God, love each other, and raise a family in that context. I talk about that all the time because I think that's the best possible outcome, the best possible possibility. Well, the world says, what if we change that up? What if we switch that up? And, and, and what if we open the, the Pandora's box to same sex? Uh, how much longer before it's, which we're going to adjust the ages, you know, we're going to lower that age down so we can have a, an adult and a minor. Oh, that will never happen. I hope not. What if, we, what if we have two wives? What if we get polygamy in there? How long will that stay out? I, you, okay, Mike, you're just such a doomsayer. That'll never happen. That'll never happen. But if we pursue this idea of marriage equality, then what does the new marriage equality look like? Well, if man and woman is equal, and same sex is equal, what's the next equal? Adult minor? Multiple wives? What's the next equal version of marriage? You, you cannot divorce from the original plan. You can't separate from the original plan and stay on a, on a, on a good, good move. It's going to sink. And, and so, so the family is going to suffer. And when the family suffers, the community suffers. And the children suffer. This, this is Okay, so we're in 2020, and we have the transgender movement. My heart breaks for young ladies. Maybe you have a daughter. Maybe you have three daughters. And maybe your daughter's involved in sports. And I think of the transgender thing coming through sports. I think that's not fair. It's not, and, and, and so I have all these, all these worldly arguments, but at the end of the day, you know which one is the biggest and most important argument? Is this one here in the Bible. Verse 9, or do you not know that the wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Those outside of Christ will not inherit the kingdom of God. People who look at their lives and say, I don't see any sin. I don't have to change anything. God actually approves of my sinful choice, and I'm okay. I don't have to repent from anything. I can just proceed on this path. That's a problem for my heart. Because as per the biblical definition, they're going to spend eternity separated from God, and I don't want that. Because I love them. Because I care about them. Because I want to follow God's word. Religious freedom means that we have an opportunity to free people from the chains of sin. Any one of those sins. Pick greedy. You think there's some greedy people here in America? Do you really need to make that much money? Okay, you think about how much money some of these people... Okay, we can have that conversation. All right, that's enough. That's enough. Religious freedom. We were, we were created free. 
We were born free, and we have an opportunity to take part in our government, to continue promoting religious freedom so that, so that we can take the good news of Jesus Christ and tell the whole world about it. That's the good news. That's what I want to do. I want to free people from the chains of sin. Amen? That's what I want to do. So let's use the, let's use the, the, the sinful government. Somebody made the, the comparison between voting for one candidate or the other. They said, well, if you pick this person, you're picking Jesus. And if you pick this person, you're picking Barabbas. I thought, really? I thought, which one of them is Jesus? Because it really looks like we're picking between Barabbas and Barabbas, okay? Uh, and, and, and I think about this. I'm like, look, neither candidates are qualified for, for uh, being the savior of the universe. One of them is Jesus. No, he's not. No, neither, none of them are. I wouldn't even vote for him to be the pastor of this church. I wouldn't even be qualified to be an elder. No, not a deacon. I wouldn't even let him volunteer in the kids' ministry, okay? But that's the thing. I'm not voting for a best friend. I'm not voting for a new savior. I'm not voting for a pastor. I'm voting for a leader in a secular government. I'm voting for his policies or her policies, whatever your convictions are. I'm voting for policies that will help me continue to live in a free America where I can tell the world about Jesus Christ. God, thank you that we live there. And I pray for the generations that follow us. I pray that this can continue to be a free nation where we can continue to tell people about you, to to run forward with the gospel message without chains so that we can tell people how to, to accept Christ as their Savior and be forgiven. Of the many sins, man, we have so many things. I struggle with so many different things, and I'm so glad you forgave me of my sins. That's the best thing that ever happened to me in my life. And I pray that I can take the freedom that I have and use it as an opportunity to run forward with your good news to the world. We love you, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I talk about it a lot because it's the best thing that ever happened to me. You're thinking to yourself, it's the best thing that ever happened to me as well. Jesus forgave you of your sins. That's a good day. That's a good thing. And if you're thinking, I haven't been forgiven of my sins, I pray that you'll do so today, that you'll accept Christ's forgiveness that he offers to everyone. Let's stand and sing our song of invitation. so much for who you are uh, and absolutely thank you for placing us in this country where we continue to have freedom of religion. Lord, I just pray that we do not take that for granted, that we use every opportunity available to us, walk through every door that you open, crawl through every window, 
Lord, you are good, and we want to share you with those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody have a great week.